to move on to taking measurements from the strain gauges. And the first thing we need to know is we've talked about the gauge factor. What does that mean in terms of the measurement? So the first thing is we'll do a simple formula. And this is a rearrangement of the gauge factor formula. So we have our change of resistance now that we're interested in, which is equal to the gauge factor times the strain times the start resistance. Gauge factor normally of two, one like strain or 0 0.000001 times 350. So we have a change per microstrain, in this case, of 0.7 of a milio. Now I talk about measuring the invisible with the undetectable. So that's where we are. So how do we take this invisible measurement that produces an almost undetectable resistance change? Well, I'm sure many of you recognize the Wheatstone Bridge. And there we have Sir Charles Wheatstone, the guy who didn't invent it. A guy called Christie invented it. Sir Charles Wheatstone did give a nod to Christie, but he was a bit of a rogue, and I think he got his name put on it. Um, but anyway, I digress. Essentially, this is a balancing circuit. And so if I move on a slide, I would liken it to your traditional kitchen balance, where if, I, if R1 and R2 are the same values, so I liken them to the same size of this weigh scale. If they have the same value, the pointer here will be pointing to zero. Equally, if these two are the same, this point here will be at zero or halfway between the excitation voltage. Of course, if R3 and R4 are the same value, it will also be true this side as well, and therefore I'll have no output from the bridge. If I introduce an imbalance in one or more arms, then I will get a change of output. And this particular diagram shows what we would call a full bridge. Now you'd have one or more strain gauge in each of these arms, and this would be something like a commercial load cell. So all commercial load cells use full bridges, active resistors or strain gauges in each arm. For general stress analysis, we use quarter bridge. In other words, one of the four resistors is a strain gauge. The other three are back in the instrument. Um, and I've just brought up one little um, addition here that I don't normally um, talk about, but we've got R1 and R2. If they're the same value, this point is at zero. If R3, often called the dummy resistor, is the same as RG, the strain gauge resistance, then I'll have balance. Also, the resistance of the lead wires, so small R1 and R2, if they're equal as well, the bridge will be balanced. And I've just added in here R3 plus R1 is the same as RG plus R2. Now, this third wire, the so-called three-wire cord, this third wire doesn't have any effect on the output because this readout here is maybe many mega ohms, so we could ignore any resistance here. But the great thing about three-wire quarter bridge is the bridge remains balanced no matter what the length of the lead wire. It also remains balanced if there's a small temperature change in the lead wire because copper is a very good temperature sensor. So any delta R will be equal in these two as well, and it will balance out. This is the typical three-wire quarter bridge. So with a circuit, we can calibrate it. And one of the ways to calibrate it is to use a thing called shunt calibration. Again, any of you who've done electronics will know, of course, the simple calculation for resistors in parallel. And there's a, a complete calculation here to convert that change of resistance into microstrain. And let's say I choose our cal to equal 1000 microstrain. So I will close the switch, resistance change the equivalent of 1000 microstrain. Now, this particular three wire circuit, R1 would cause this value to be slightly lower than you would expect. R2 would cause the same desensitization to the strain gauge. And therefore, when I throw this switch, if this doesn't read a thousand microstrain here, I can boost the gain to read a thousand and automatically compensate for the lead wire resistance. And that's really good if you're working on something like a bridge, you might have maybe 50, 100 meter leads. The shunt cal circuit can enable you to automatically correct for that lead wire desensitization. And in digital instrumentation, you press a button and it does the calculation for you. Um, a lot of what we talk about with instrumentation is talking about using dedicated instruments. So although you can go to first principles and build something yourself, Dedicated instruments do all of this for you. So they generally include the bridge completion, the shunt calibration circuits with the maths to cope with that. Variable bridge excitation. Again, don't have time to go into it in detail, but a small gauge on a plastic or composite would heat up a lot more than if you have a large gauge on a piece of aluminium. And so you might need some variable bridge excitation in your instrumentation. 
again, beyond the scope of this lecture, but anti-alias filtering is essential, particularly because almost every instrument now is um, digital, and so you've got some sort of HD converter. Uh, you then would cal calibrate that in some sort of engineering units, and then you would apply some error correction. And again, the data sheet that I showed you earlier has some additional information, and if you plug that into your instrument, you can make some error corrections. Now, in this particular slide, I do like this picture here. This is actually a picture of Dr. Felix Zandman, the guy who started the company back in the 60s. The mass he's doing there has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I just like the fact that uh, he's the guy who started all of this.